welcome everyone to the second last uh, spring session of uh, Tesco Tuesdays. Uh, my name is Jim McGill. I'm uh, the Canadian National Sales Manager up here in Canada, naturally. And uh, in my last life, I was 30 years at the third largest utility in Canada, Hydro One. And uh, during that time, I was a uh, field technician for 15 years and a meter supervisor for five. I did the AMI rollout up here, uh, which was a uh, five years, five year capital project. And then I wound up uh, being an engineering supervisor for five years doing new commercial industrial services. Uh, during that time frame, uh, we have a training facility up here. It's called the uh, Miri Hydro One training facility. And uh, I was privileged to be a uh, part time instructor there on and off for eight years, usually when their guy was on holidays or throwing a guy on holidays or sick or they had an unusually large class needed a second uh, banana sideshow bob to their crusty as it were and um, also we have the eda metering conference once a year up here and i was privileged to be on that committee for eight years and president of the thing from 2000 to 2010 and 2011 so certainly haven't seen it all but i've seen uh, quite a bit and uh, hopefully during this presentation, you'll see something that uh, that spawns a question or uh, or something that you will think to yourself, gee, I never thought of that before. And if either of those things happen, well, this has been a success. So, uh, as Andy says, if you have any questions along the road here for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, just uh, unmute and speak up and uh, we'll get those answers for you if we have them. If not, we'll certainly take them away, do a little bit of research and then uh, and then respond. Okay, onward. So again, Jim McGill, right? And uh, you're going to do an AMI deployment, so it's a huge job, really, and it, it has all sorts of ramifications and uh, and uh, opportunities that comes along with it. You're going to have an opportunity to straighten out all of your meter records, and I don't care whether you're a 200 meter utility or a two million dollar or a two million customer utility, there's going to be things that are wrong with your meter records. We do have a software program that can fix that, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. You're going to have an opportunity to look at all of your meter bases, and you're looking for, you know, potential future problems, uh, uh, you know, heated up wires, scorched lugs, things that are probably going to arise in the future. So this is an opportunity to identify those things as you go. Um, you're going to get to see almost every customer, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, um, contact with the customer can be uh, what you make of it. Uh, if you handle things well, and uh, you're going to uh, establish a very good rapport with your customers, uh, you know, other than just being a faceless bill. Um, so that, it's an opportunity if you look at it that way. Um, you're going to get a chance to install a system that's going to give you notifications of outages in advance if that technology you've chosen supports that. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to tamper proof your system because the new AMI meters are tattletales and they're going to tell you if a uh, meter's been pulled or flipped upside down or gone missing. <clears throat> Same thing for theft of power. Uh, back in the day, you'd flip a meter over it and run backwards for five days. And when you flipped it back over, it'd take five days for that to consumption to run back on the meter. So essentially the, meter, the customer had the opportunity to run away with 10 days of consumption. So there are opportunities associated with an AMI rollout. I think probably the first thing that every utility needs to understand is their geography and topography. Are you in a prairie setting? Are you in a big city? Are you in, uh, you know, in the West Coast where there's lots of mountains? All challenges for an AMI system whether it be distance, whether it be obstacles, or uh, whether it be density, they're all uh, challenges. So you need to understand uh, where your pockets of high density meters are, where there's very few, and what the challenges are associated with interrogating those areas. So once you do that, I mean, you're gonna need to pick a system that probably suits your geography the best. Uh, there's several types out there. There's the radio mesh, which is an excellent solution for a high density area because the meters talk to one another and then through one another they reach a collector. Uh, 
tower-based systems are a good solution where there's a lot of pockets, uh, small towns. Uh, comes to mind for me up here in Canada is Newfoundland, where they have uh, several small fishing villages scattered around the coast, and uh, one tower in each uh, in each community would uh, be a good solution for them. You know, there's challenges you know associated with everyone as well, like uh, in case of a tower, you're going to have to lease space off of a existing tower or put your own tower up and tower maintenance is probably not one of those areas where utility has staff that are that are used to servicing such things so power line carrier uh, very good solution for for uh, spread out areas um, one of the challenges with power line carrier is the amount of time it takes to interrogate a meter i'm not sure what it is these days but back when i was uh, building a business case here in Ontario, it was 20 seconds per meter. So when you start doing the mathematics, you probably don't have enough time in a 24 hour day to interrogate more than, you know, uh, three, two or 300,000 meters a day. Uh, cellular backhaul, same challenge, takes a little bit of time, but if there is cell signal in the area, a very good solution for uh, Wyoming or, or Saskatchewan or someplace where there's, there's uh, meters are very spread out. Possibly, you know, the, so pro the ideal solution for your utility might be two head ends, two different systems. A head end is kind of like the main interrogation uh, computer that's backing your uh, utility, um, sort of like the black box that, that interrogates all the meters and stores the data and it can be transferred over to your billing system. The next thing you're going to need to understand is what tools you already have at your disposal. In your utility uh, line staff in the control room well these these people are going to come to your rescue when a meter blade a meter base faults uh, probably the customer may or may not call the control room which is going to dispatch a, a line truck to come and isolate that service while it's repaired um, during my rollout we we did the thing in uh, in an organized fashion billing cycle by billing cycle uh, so billing cycle is a, is a segment of the city uh, that you would send the bills to uh, sort of in an organized fashion throughout the month. Impossible to send out a bill the first of every month to every customer you have usually. So the city was broken up into cycles and uh, the billing department was a big help in, in helping us organize those cycles. Um, so what we did is we had a bucket truck and an electrician sort of follow us through these billing cycles, anticipating, you know, meter based faults and something like that things like that. So the reason this next bullet here, conditions of service is highlighted is because this is probably the biggest takeaway on this slide is that every utility in Canada has a conditions of service document on their corporate drive, probably the same in the United States, might be called something different. Basically, it's a document that, that explains what your obligations are to your customer and more importantly, what the customer's obligations are to your utility. So things like you know, not building any structures over the meter, like, a, I don't know, planting a big tree in front of it or, or boxing it in so that you can't get at it. And uh, it, it defines where the uh, demarcation point is between the customer and the utility, whether it's the weather head at the top of the stack, those connections, whether it's the underground lines and that uh, terminate at the top two lugs in the meter base, it, it defines all of these things. And you're going to need to get very familiar with that document uh, before you do your AMI rollout. Uh, you're going to have to understand what, what rules are in there that pertain to the customer so that when they call you, you're going to be able to reference section 3.8, whatever, item two, that says that the demarcation point on that particular type of service is the weatherhead. So the customer, you own the base and you own the stack, so on and so forth. But get, get familiar with that document. Your IT department, obviously, is going to, is going to have to uh, write the script or, or, or do the, the magic that they do to get the readings from the AMI system onto a bill and out to the customer. Your uh, legal department, loss control departments are going to be important as you run across things that you didn't see coming. Uh, you're going to need to sit down with them ahead of time and talk about how you want to handle theft of powers, talk about how you want to handle uh, uh, marijuana grow operations, so on and so forth. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, warehouse staff is going to be important because you're going to have meters coming in in a larger utility by the thousands. 
they're going to have to be scanned in inventory or they're going to have to be logged somehow and there's going to be a lot of a lot of activity in your warehouse department on tractor selection is going to be very important for example you know if you have to put a tower on top of a building you're going to need to talk to the building owner and, and arrange some sort of a lease or uh, agreement uh, or maybe one of your cell phone vendors you're going to maybe put a collector up on one of their towers or something like that so uh, those agreements are going to be part of it your ami vendors are going to be huge um, what we suggest is that you talk to them about your service territory and your geography and point out the challenges that they are going to have to help you overcome so if it's a matter of distance like a prairie province or a prairie state uh, they're going to have to you know, help you conquer those those long distance meters. Most AMI radio mesh meters have a range of about maybe 500 yards. So if there's two miles in between a farmhouse on the prairies, that's something they're going to have to come up with a solution for. Um, just have to move this box here. Yeah, upgrade schedule agreements. So your AMI vendor, uh, you know, they need to understand they can't just be running upgrades meter firmware or radio firmware without letting you know first. Uh, we recommend uh, a meter farm or some such device where you can segregate some meters uh, on this device and have them upgrade those meters first. And we recommend a selection or a, a mix of AMI meters that are commercial industrial in nature, that are residential in nature, and that are transformer rated in nature so that when they release some sort of an upgrade to the to the meters, they all get the upgrade at the same time, and there's no uh, demarcation between the, the uh, commercial industrial meters and the residential meters. Because at the end of the day, they all have to live in one big happy family. You know, whether it be a, a, a church in the middle of a subdivision or a strip mall, and you know, surrounded by homes naturally. So all of these meters have to accept that firm grade, a firmware upgrade seamlessly. Uh, installation vendors, um, not sure if you have meter readers that you could retrain to install your meters or whether you'll have to do what I did, which was an outside contractor. But these people have to be trained and understand that there are hazards are uh, related to pulling a single phase meter off a house. And uh, um, it's, it's probably one of the more dangerous things that a, a meter person will ever do is to pull a single phase meter off a house because there's no fusing to help you if the thing explodes or whatever. You're going to have to monitor these people. You're going to have to do crew visits and, uh, you know, make sure that they're following all the safety rules and wearing their PPE. Performance agreements we'll talk about a little bit later where uh, certain areas of, of the city, you can maybe change 100 in a day. Other, other places in the city where there's inside meters, maybe only 30. So you're going to have to make these agreements with your installation vendor that they can meet your your targets. They, they, they want to knock and wait at the door a little bit. You know, you can't just, you know, tap tap on the door there and run around the side of the house and pull the meter. You got to give the customer a chance to answer the door and uh, um, make them understand what's about to happen. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Contract electricians. Um, most customers don't understand that they own the meter base. And here in Canada, at least, the utility cannot do repairs on customer-owned equipment. So you have to have a contract electrician to follow you around. And if something does go wrong with that meter base, they're going to have to affect the repairs because their license covers that kind of liability. Utilities usually doesn't. Uh, and you can't have them come in the next day. You're going to need them to agree to be there within, say, a half an hour or something like that. So all of these things are important in uh, contractor selection. This last bullet here, I consider to be one of the most important ones. Uh, in all of the contracts that I had to deal with, there was a hold harmless clause in all of the contracts. Now, what that means is that if your installation vendor pops over a fence and breaks it or steps on a 20-year-old rose bush, it's on them to make that good with the customer. If they break something that causes a loss of revenue to either the customer or a loss of cash, either the customer or the utility, that's on them. So it's very important to have that hold harmless clause in any contract that you negotiate. Uh, yeah, you, you don't want to just show them and start pulling meters ahead of uh, uh, 
like uh, without any notice to the customer whatsoever. So we uh, we sent out uh, you know little ads in the newspapers. We had a little TV uh, commercial. We sent out uh, inserts in bills. Um, if you are still using meter readers to read meters, maybe they could leave a door card um, on the doorknob or on the whatever. That's something to let the customer know that that AMI rollout is coming with smart meters, whatever, and give them an opportunity to call in and ask questions, and maybe they might even want to make an appointment. So uh, it's important to let them know ahead of time uh, what's going to happen and give them an, a chance to absorb it. Uh, again, most customers own the meter base and they don't know that, but it's important that they understand that that if something goes wrong, it's it's their equipment, and that is because the meter base was probably put there by the developer, builder, whatever. Uh, the utility probably didn't put that meter base there, so it belongs to the house. Um, and your answering service at your at your utility should have a you know push three to learn more about smart meters that sort of thing, and there'll be uh, some quick Q and A there on on the, on your answering service. Uh, we used a program called Big Mouth up here to uh, call the customers that we knew we were going to be at uh, in the next week or so, and it leaves a, a pre recorded message saying uh, you know we predict that we'll be using changing your meters sometime uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, if you have any questions, please call, whatever. Uh, that was just, Big Mouth was just the name of our particular vendor. Opt-out agreements, if you're gonna, if you're gonna consider those, an opt-out agreement is, is, is something the customer would have to sign to say they absolutely do not want one of these things on the side of their house. And they'll have to understand that there's probably gonna be a charge associated with that, like, I don't know, fifteen dollars, you know, a month to read the meter, and uh, so it's up to each and every utility to decide whether they want to even entertain opt-out agreements. Here in Canada, we were told every customer must have an AMI meter and must be on time of use billing, so we didn't have to go down that path. But you may have to. So, uh, installation progression plan. Uh, um, generally, it's a good idea to locate and install collectors ahead. Of mass deployment. Now, why is that? Well, well, smart meter has generally three functions. The first one is to record the data from the from the house and store it. That's the first two. And the third one is to get rid of that data to the head end at the first opportunity. So, what can happen is that if you install, say, five or seven thousand meters in a particular part of the city, and then put a collector on. The meters that are already out there are desperate to get rid of the data that they have stored, and they can quickly overwhelm the collector. So they're all going to reach out to that collector at the same time, and they're, you know, it only has so much bandwidth. But if you install it ahead of time and then start populating the meters around it, they all, all come online in a fairly orderly fashion. Uh, when you want to go to take a meter off a house, it's a good idea to take a picture of it and. Uh, want to stand back a little bit to get a picture of the siding or bricks or some other telltale trait of the house because everyone's just a little bit different. So you want to be able to show the customer meter on the side of the house before you remove it and most importantly what the reading of it was because that's one thing you will run into is how do I know my old meter wasn't uh, that you didn't write down the wrong reading or whatever. So you want to write the addresses on the meters before you take them off if you can. And uh, you want to keep those meters for a period of time. It's up to you to decide how long that might be. Uh, for us, we kept them for two full billing cycles to give the customer to compare his new bill with his old bill and uh, possibly dispute the meter. Uh, but if you go ahead and throw them out immediately, well, the, their opportunity to do that is is gone, really. So uh, you want to also, uh, as I talked to a, a bit about before, the billing cycle thing. It's probably best idea to do it in an orderly fashion going across the city instead of sprinkling them from one end to the other. And uh, it's just better to do it methodically. Realistic deployment rates, we, we already talked about that a little bit. Uh, we called meters that are on the front or side of the house the low hanging fruit. When your AMI uh, installation team is just starting out, you don't really want to convolute their, their, their training with, uh, with uh, complicated meters that are in the basement or in backyards or what is best to do, do the easy meters first 
get all your processes down and your people trained and then move to the more complicated stuff like backyards and inside meters. Very important that you have a realistic time frame for doing this. You can't have your CEO coming to you and saying, well, you know what? You're going to have to change uh, 230,000 meters this year. It's, you just can't do that. You want to play the safety card saying, you know, maybe we can do it, maybe we can't, but it's not safe to just, just rush like that. We want to be able to look at every meter base and make sure there's no problems going forward. Uh, I just talked to a customer about this an hour ago. You don't want to uh, have a meter blowing up a year after you change it because uh, your, your, your people are going to come to you and say, hey, you were just there last year and changed this meter. Now, all of a sudden, it's burned out. So how did that happen? You want to do your due diligence and uh, have a good look at the meter base and uh, use a, a maybe a gap indicator or something to, uh, to check the <laughs> tension on the lugs before you uh, put the meter back on. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, but just because your AMI rollout is done doesn't mean you're not going to be held accountable for it, you know, two or three years from now. So you want to do all you can to make sure that uh, the, there's no more problems in the field going forward. So uh, meter jaw integrity, uh, after a period of time through vibrations and through changing meters over the years, the meter jaws can lose some of their holding force on the, on the back of the meter. Um, if you look at the back of an old, say, Sangamo CJ3S or Westinghouse D5S, they have very beefy blades on the back of them, thick and, uh, and wide. And a lot of the new AMI meters have a smaller uh, base or stab on the back of them. So it stands to reason that if you pull off that, that meter that had the, the thick uh, blade on it and put in a meter with a smaller blade, it's going to have uh, uh, less holding force in the jaw. So um, you want to uh, have a good look at the meter base jaw integrity before you put that AMI, AMI, AMI meter on. So again, you know, by checking that, that uh, jaw integrity is good due diligence. You want to be able to say to the customer a year later, yes, we did check your base. Yes, we did uh, everything we could do to make sure that there wasn't going to be any problems going forward. So again, uh, things that are probably going to happen uh, is faulted bases. And up there at the one o'clock position is a picture of one of our hot socket gap indicators. You simply push that into uh, the meter jaw. And if it goes in, if that little blade goes into the jaw, then, then there's something wrong with the tension on that jaw and it really probably should be changed. You're going to need to uh, have uh, electricians on standby. You're going to need to have meter base covers in case you do have to walk away from a faulted base. Uh, some repair kits. We have a real nice meter base repair kit that uh, we, the utility can't use up here because we're not allowed to fix the base. But we can strongly suggest to our electricians that they carry one of these with them in case a base, uh, a base does fault. Uh, to the right of that is a little safety clip that you can put on the jaw to restore tension uh, to the jaw if you, if you do have to put the meter back on and walk away from it for 30 days or so. But we strongly recommend that if you're going to do that, you get the customer to sign a waiver document saying that they will have that base repaired in, in a certain time frame, like 10 days, 20, 30, whatever your utility uh, decides. So pulling a single phase meter, a meter is, like I said, excuse me, a little while Probably one of the most difficult or dangerous things you'll ever do, not difficult. So you're going to want to use all four senses when you're doing this. You're going to be looking for burn marks on the meter base when you first walk up to it to, to see if, there, if you can see if there's been any scorching or any arcing going on in that base in years gone by. As you're pulling the meter, you can listen for debris falling into the bottom of the base as the Jaws are disintegrating inside. Uh, if there has been any heating in that base, you probably smell something and you feel for that, that crunching feeling as you're pulling that base off. If there's a hole in the base, like a missing knockout cover or whatever, just be ready for anything. <laughs> there could be anything at all in that meter base. Not so much snakes up here, but an awful lot of wasps and bees and things like that. So uh, be prepared.
other things that uh, that will arise is, uh, as I spoke about a little bit ago, is uh, firmware uh, upgrades and radio upgrades. Um, as your AMI vendor uh, continues to build meters for you, is there a good chance that uh, one of their part suppliers may go out of business or doesn't offer this particular diode anymore or particular type of radio and they're going to have to change that. So when they do that, there's going to probably be a firmware, radio firmware upgrade to all of your existing meters. And uh, you want to be sure that that goes seamlessly. And uh, again, you know, you don't let your AMI vendor unleash an upgrade without testing it first. Um, I put this last bullet here just to, re just to remind myself to tell you a little story. I uh, left work on a Friday afternoon once upon a time. And when I came back in Monday morning, I had 40,000 black meters. What had happened was the MI technology I was using, a firmware upgrade was a two part thing. The first thing that had to happen is they did a, a firmware upgrade to the radios and they gave that a soak time of a day and then they pushed the firmware upgrade to the meters. Well, when one of the radios didn't take the firmware upgrade or something went wrong, then along behind it came the meter firmware and it caused a uh, traffic jam, if you will, in the whole AMI system. And the whole thing was black when I came in Monday morning. We had to get all the meter readers back online to go up and start reading the meters while the AMI vendor took about three weeks to get that fixed. So it's a good idea to to test any 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 potential upgrade on a meter farm uh, or something uh, first. Make them prove it. So again, that's what I was just talking about there. The meter meter farm is also, you know, good for testing your reverse power flow uh, recordings, uh, disconnect switch testing, um, segment tests on the uh, on the readout on the front of the meter, uh, how the radios are working, and uh, as I spoke about before, AMI or rather uh, commercial industrial meters connecting seamlessly with uh, residential meters. This is a pretty big meter farm here, and if you're a smaller utility, maybe you only want one panel or two panels and, and theoretically your meter farm is a representation of your of your real um, population so 85 percent residential 10 uh, percent self-contained commercial industrial and five percent uh, transformer rated so you should have a selection of those sockets on your meter farm you're going to run into the tin foil hat crowd which is the people out there that are convinced your AMI system is giving them brain tumors or headaches or uh, something, uh, we, it's not a bad idea to do a propagation study with your AMI vendor and they can tell you uh, the signal strength coming from each of the AMI meters and believe me, it's minimal. We have a, a little tool, it's a, it's a radio frequency detector and then the beauty of it is you can hand it to a customer and they can go and stand by their AMI meter and there'll just be a slight deflection every 20 seconds when the when the AMI meter is pinging. They take it into their micro, stand beside their microwave oven and turn that on for 10 seconds and watch it deflect fully, watch the numbers climb. Same with a cell phone. They could uh, you know, call you on their cell phone and you could watch the major deflection of the uh, RF detector. So you're gonna run into these folks and uh, if you can get rid of even one of them with, with a little meter of some sort, a little handheld device, it'll more than pay it for itself uh, immediately. You're going to have mixed up meters. Uh, you're going to have meters from other utilities, probably in your service territory. <laughs> I even found one guy who had a, he had a little a cabin in the woods and uh, he, he couldn't help noticing that his people. Uh, and his little cabin was uh, far, far less than his home bill. So he was actually taking his meter off the side of his house and taking it up to his cabin <laughs> and then bringing it back and putting it back on his house, thinking that it was the meter that was either fast or slow. And the only reason we found this out is because it kept reporting as being off, off every weekend. And we sent a bucket truck around there one Saturday. And lo and behold, the meter was gone. And it was back Monday morning, so we figured out what this guy was doing, but anything could happen out there. So this is an opportunity to never let those kind of things happen because you can monitor what's going on with your AMI system day to day. Um, again, we spoke earlier about uh, about meter records and uh, uh, 
this is an opportunity to make sure that you know where every single meter is and uh, uh, get rid of any flaws in your records. And our, our, our software is called Meter Manager. And you scan the meter into inventory, you scan it into a truck, you scan it onto the side of the house, and there it is. It stays there forever and uh, can't be removed or go offline without you knowing about it. It cost a little bit of money up front, but uh, it's uh, that problem solved forever. And generally speaking, AMI rollouts are done under a capital budget instead of an OM&A uh, operating budget. So this is a good time to spend that money. You're going to find theft of power situations. Uh, again, you're going to want to talk to your um, your lost people, your and your legal department to find out how they want to handle those things. Um, you know, your installer might pull the meter off the side of the house and the, the pool pump is still running or radio, uh, rather, porch light is still on. So, you know, it's the, <laughs> during their training, they should be, you know, smart enough to or trained enough to to look for those things. And uh, yeah, your revenue protection group is going to want to weigh in on these things and, and find out how you want to handle them. Marijuana grow operations. Not so much of a problem up here in Canada anymore because our liberal government up here has decreed that you're allowed to grow four marijuana plants for every adult member of the household. So if you have you and your wife and two kids at 20, 22 years old, you can have 16 marijuana plants up here legally. But a lot of places aren't like that. Uh, we can't get a open up here, but we can grow dope. I guess the theory is to keep us from so stone that we don't complain about it. So again, be prepared. Um, you're gonna to need to, to have a lot of things to do your AMI rollout, starting at the top left corner, meter seals, right? Meter seal for each and every meter you change. Um, meter rings is another thing. You're probably gonna to need to replace, I don't know, 25, 40% of your, of your rings. So you want to make sure you have lots of those in stock. There's the hot socket gap indicator again and the safety clip. And earlier I mentioned about the uh, meter base repair kit, which is there at the uh, bottom right corner. It has a variety of, of lugs in it and, and some other tools and uh, bits and pieces that you might need to repair a base. There's the RF meter at the bottom center. Um, again, it's just a handheld tool. You can give it to the customer and they can they can go and look at the readings themselves, which is always a, a good thing rather than you you ha handling it yourself. Uh, bottom left, meter socket jumper covers. You may have a meter that's designed to go on 123 Main Street, for example, and you get there and there's something wrong with the meter, the segments are missing off the, off the readout or some such, and you can't install that meter there, but you don't want to leave the customer without power, so you can use one of these jumper covers to uh, to leave them energized while you uh, go away and get another meter designated for that location. So you're probably only gonna get one chance to do uh, an initial AMI rollout anyway. Up here in Canada, a lot of utilities are on their second, second AMI uh, rollout, replacing old technology, um, AMI2 we call it. So if you do your due diligence and uh, and homework and understand your service territory and the challenges that you're going to face, uh, you're going to be far far more uh, well equipped to handle these things that are going to arise. So try and have fun with it. it, it you're going to learn a lot and you're going to uh, see a lot that you didn't think you would, uh, but you'll have stories to tell when it's all said and done. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, here's my contact information here. Uh, looks like we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. When we ran through this presentation last week, I uh, slowed down a little bit and took uh, 55 minutes and I got in trouble with the principal. So uh, I tried to speed it up here a little bit today. Hopefully there are some questions and uh, that we can answer for you. Thanks again. Over to you, Andy. Thank you so much, Jim. And uh... I wouldn't say I scolded you. I was just saying you went very long in case there were questions. I thought we would have um, a lot of questions coming in from you guys. This is a um, pretty big, vast topic that, you know, you guys could have a lot of questions on. I did get some um, coming in. I didn't want to interrupt you, though, because you were doing such a great job. So um, one of the questions that just came in uh, from Sean, would you recommend doing SAP and MAI at the same time? 
and C P N M A I. Not for familiar with it. M A I. A M I. A M I. Sorry, did I just say it backwards? <laughs> oh, okay. You know what? It probably be your idea to get your uh, your S A P uh, prepared for this. Uh, the answer to the question is no. Uh, you're going to have enough on your hands doing an AMI rollout without trying to integrate that system in into a system of record that you're not familiar with either. Uh, so I would recommend doing your, your system of record ahead of time. Um, yeah, why confuse something that's going to be confusing enough? I hope that uh, helps. Sure, Sean said, thank you, Jim. Um, one of the other questions, what are the key elements in your opinion when planning an AMI project? Well, your service territory uh, and knowing what your challenges are going to be and your uh, uh, selection of technology. Um, you know, as we talked about right off the top of the, right at the top of the hour, um, certain Technologies are suited better to certain areas, so I would say those are the big two: um, your geography and your your AMI technology. All right, thank you. Uh, next one here: Do you see the benefit in doing a thermal scan of the meter base or socket at any point to confirm any hot spots, in addition to gap indicators and visual inspection to help determine heat or arcing? Absolutely. The, the more due diligence you do, the better off you are. Um, heat sensing equipment is expensive. I don't see. Financially, how you'd get one of those into everybody's toolkit, but if you can find a small handheld version of such a thing, absolutely. Every little bit of uh, every little bit of precaution you take uh, can only serve you better uh, down the road. Okay, and of course, if you guys have a question, you can always message us uh, privately or through the whole group. And this one came in privately, so I'm not saying the name, but. How do you best convince a lineman of this technology? Some of them are very skeptical and tend not to trust the technology. Well, that's that's kind of a. Let's see how I'm going to word this. It, it the the project is going to happen or it's not. If it's being top driven, which all AMI rollouts usually are, I don't see where a lineman's opinion. Of the technology is really crucial. Um, you know, I how am I going to put that? It, it, you just tell them it's going to benefit the customer if they're the ones out doing the face-to-face uh, -face communications with the customer. Then the customer is going to have more control over their bill by knowing how much electricity they're using at given times of the day. So if they're looking for you know, some some something to tell the customer to explain why they're doing it. That's one thing they could tell them. But uh, generally speaking, the project is going to go ahead, regardless of any field staff's opinion of it. Uh, don't know if that helps or not. <laughs> okay, so let me see what else I have coming in here. Should we take stock of our current field and warehouse prior to an AMI rollout? Yes, absolutely. The second slide that we that we saw there, uh, you know, you're going to need seals and rings and bits and pieces uh, to to repair meter bases. Probably, in some cases, you might have to replace the connections between the customer's wire and the utilities wire, which are called insulinks, is what we call them up here. So you need to have a, a, a fairly decent supply of of all of these things on hand. You're going to need as many seals as meters and probably about 25% of the rings, as I said earlier. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, anticipate uh, what you're going to need. I mean, your, your, your meter readers that are out there, your, your field metering staff are really good resources for you to talk to ahead of deployment uh, to, to let you know what parts of the city are old and and where they're seeing you know meter bases hanging off the wall and other things that should be repaired as you go um 
they may be able to help you gauge how many, um, you know, screws or whatever, uh, maybe not screw, things to repair meter bases and putting them on the wall. Those are good resources to sit down and talk to before you do an AMI rollout, just to give you an idea of what you're going to need. Okay, next one coming in when using a 3rd party vendor to handle the physical deployment. What are the biggest issues you encounter with getting it done? Right? And getting the data back. Also, how do they typically provide the data exchange for the old. New meter documentation, flat file pictures, etc. I hope I'm asking that right. <laughs> it sounds like it's sort of a 2 part thing. Yeah, do you uh, need me to repeat either of them? <laughs> No, the, the, the first one, uh, the biggest challenge with contractors is usually they get paid by piecework. So they get paid by the number of meters that they change in a day. So the, the tendency for them is to hurry. You know, the more, more meters they can change in a day, the more money they're going to make. So that's where that deployment rate comes in. And along with the deployment rate, may be a adjustment to the amount of money that you have to pay them per installation. For example, maybe they, they only make uh, $2 changing a meter on the side of a house or on the front. Maybe they make $4 for changing one in a backyard. Maybe they make $15 or some such number for changing a basement meter, but just simply because of the time it takes. So one of the biggest challenges with the deployment team is controlling their speed and making sure that they give the customer uh, a good experience. So that's the biggest challenge I had. And, uh, you know, I mean, you want to do crew visits on them uh, regularly to make sure that they're wearing their gloves and their glasses and all of their PPE. Because again, when they're rushed, rushed, rushed like that, the tendency is to cut corners. So policing uh, the uh, AMI installers and uh, rate of deployment and what you're paying them uh, per type of installation is, is a big challenge. Now, for the second one, I think it was off meter documentation that we were mostly talking about there. The question Correct there. and there's there's also a follow up to that. Do you have 3rd party deployment vendors provide GIS coordinates or additional area documentation pictures videos to help validate. In my case, back in uh, in 2006, when I started. My rollout, a lot of this technology wasn't available. So the pictures that they took were absolutely vital, saved me all kinds of trouble. Um, they were doing them with, uh, with uh, a scanner, but the scanners did not have uh, GPS coordinates on them. Uh, now, here we are in 2021, where almost all of those scanners do have uh, GPS uh, enablement. Um, so in my case, you didn't, but it's highly recommended now. Tesco, uh, if if someone's using our our meter manager software, we have uh, we can uh, uh, network with several different types of handheld scanners, all of which have GPS coordinates. Uh, then you just bring the the uh, the tool back at the end of the day. You put it in a docking station, and it seamlessly downloads all that information into your head end. Okay. Let's see next coming in uh, from Sean. If the meter socket was damaged during installation, did you have an electrician fix that at the company's cost? Uh, in our case, yes, we budgeted for for a certain amount of money uh, to repair those things going forward. Uh, we had a licensed electrician doing it, and I spoke about this before because the utility was not allowed to work on customer owned equipment. Um, they, uh, we budgeted uh, uh, as best we could. I don't remember what the number was, but we anticipated about one in 100 meter bases being faulted. Uh, we were able to capture that under capital budget instead of uh, operating. Um, so again, right back to the very first slide, this is an opportunity to uh, make your system more robust and more reliable going forward. If you can capture these problems as you go doing an AMI rollout instead of waiting for something to go wrong years later, I hope that helps a bit. Yep, he says, thank you. 
and let's see. Is there a good solution on the market to enable utilities to test communication strength prior to installing meters at an inside location? Yes, yes, we have uh, a, a new tool, a signal strength analyzer. Um, now you 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 can't just go out ahead of AMI and, and find out where there is signal strength for the simple fact that you don't have any signal until you start to install collectors and things like that. But we have a tool that uh, can tell you from a basement at you know where the signal is is strongest in that particular structure. Um, maybe near a window or something like that. That's uh, if you want more information on on something like that, contact your your Tesco regional manager, and uh, he can help you out with that. Sounds like you're trying to steal from John's presentation next week. We're going to be doing the uh, communication equipment, and he'll be touching on that as well. Talk about the new signal strength analyzer and other ways to help communicate as well. So if you guys are more interested in that, be sure to definitely check out next week. Um, so let me see here. I'm I'm getting a lot of questions from you guys. So keep them coming. That's great. Uh, the next one is, what is the benefit of going AMI for, uh, going AMI from AMR? AMR this, is this. sorry. AMR is automatic meter reading. It's uh, the the meter store uh, uh, data, and then they they retain the data until you can get around and and collect it. AMI is an intelligent interconnected web of meters that communicates uh, constantly uh, with your head in. So anything that's happening out in the field is, is detectable immediately with AMI. Also things like uh, uh, you know, uh, revenue protection, uh, a meter that's been flipped over, a meter that's been removed uh, so that somebody can do work on the house, uh, all these things are are uh, immediately available to the head end system with AMI. And with AMR, you have to physically drive around or, or, or get around to interrogate the meters. I have a customer out in Alberta that uh, has several pockets of meters in small towns and they use an airplane <laughs> to uh, fly over these communities and interrogate the AMR meters. But then you lose any instant interactivity with the with the meter, uh, so uh, AMI is is a far more superior uh, system, and nobody knows what Gen three AMI is going to look like. It may have Wi Fi built into it for your for your televisions and things in your house. Um, if the infrastructure is already there, the interconnectivity um, with the head end, then then these. Future opportunities are going to be far more attainable. Whereas AMR is still just a regular meter, it's just a digital meter. It doesn't have any real intelligence to it. Okay, excellent. So um, I had this one come in. You may have answered during the presentation because it came in during the presentation. Does it matter what meter manufacturer I use when deploying AMI? The ma meter manufacturers are all good. Um, I do, it doesn't really matter whose meter you use. I think it's more it's more valuable to have uh, a better AMR AMI system. So it, it's more the the back office processes uh, that come associated with that particular meter vendor that is important as opposed to whose meter you use. I think. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next one coming in from Keith. When you mention the different versions of AMI generation one, two, three, where is there more information that outlines the generations or advances in AMI? That's a very good question. Um, I think the best thing for you to do is to talk to your your meter vendors about that as to what what new availability, new new. Uh, um, uh, Technology is is becoming available with their meters. Uh, I really don't know if there's any document that says one is this, two is that, and three is something else. Uh, you're best to uh, to rely on the resources you have at your disposal, which is your your meter vendor, and ask them what's coming up. 
Excellent. Okay. And the next one coming in, did you do a small test rollout before doing a full rollout? Yes, I did uh, actually three pilot projects using three different technologies. And uh, we picked the one that posed the fewest problems. They all had problems, but we went with the, uh, the radio mesh uh, as opposed to the tower based system. Several reasons for that, you know, again, I touched on, uh, we don't have any staff that we didn't have any staff that could actually do maintenance on the towers or, or, or on that. That hardware that had to go on the towers, everything in the system that I installed was ground level. So the collectors snapped right onto the meter base in behind the meter. And the, uh, the meter technicians were, were able to go around and change any faulty collector or whatever uh, without getting a contractor involved. Uh, so I went with the one that that I felt was uh, was uh, the easiest to maintain going forward. Okay. I'm making sure I didn't miss anyone. Let's see, this came in, you may have answered this one already. What meter testing would you recommend for AMI deployment? Uh, first article testing, FAT, uh, fat testing. So you, you you know it's best to to if you have a, a meter farm uh, uh, or or some other way of energizing the meters, you want to make sure that uh, you you look at about uh, probably five percent of of each shipment. Make sure that the 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 meter segments are all there on the display. Make sure that the radios are working. Make sure that. Uh, uh, if you apply uh, apply reverse power flow, that that it's reading that, um, that's all part of first article testing. And we covered that uh, two weeks ago, I think. But uh, there are the basic tests to to make sure you're not putting out a bunch of meters that have a faulty displays or uh, a faulty uh, uh, lights on them, faulty uh, flashing lights or whatever. So it's just reasonableness checks, you know, to make sure that. Uh, each shipment uh, doesn't have faulty diodes in them or something like that. Just basically kind of a sample, a, a, a pre-sample of each shipment. Hope that helps. All right, I did miss a comment here. Um, I don't know what you were talking about when this comment came in, but it said, from experience, don't underestimate the benefit of remote disconnects and reconnects, maybe during testing or somewhere you were just talking about a minute or two ago. We didn't we didn't put in the remote disconnects in my rollout because they weren't very reliable. They were heavy back in those days, and the meter was bulkier than a regular meter. So, if you put a remote disconnect on a problem child customer it, it, up here, the, the laws are funny up here. They would call that profiling up here. So, if you had a a big bulky meter on on one house, and and the rest of them were small little meters. The customer might say, hey, how come I got this great big thing on, on, uh, on the side of my house? Are you not telling all of my neighbors that I'm a, a bad, bad customer or something like that? So now with today's technology, the disconnect devices are small, lightweight, and inexpensive. So if you can afford it and if your budget allows, I would say that it's a very good idea to put remote disconnect on, uh, on every house. All right, uh, uh, that's okay, Keith, you can keep asking questions. This is great because I'm sure other people may have them and, and you guys are being shy, not asking. We're always going to answer your questions here, so keep them coming. Um, part of our current ITN is for a network outlay and propagation study. From your experience, does a prop study come close to the actual need when deployment completes, or do you find that you end up adding more network endpoints for redundancy or coverage? Well, not too sure about the first part of that, but I don't, don't know of anyone that ever put in an AMI system without having to add things like repeaters or relays. Uh, so if you have a, a pocket of, of meters out by a lake somewhere or at the end of a country road that are too far away to, to, to relay back to a connector, you know, maybe halfway out the road, you have to add a repeater up on one of the poles which is basically just a little device with one of the AMI radios in it. It doesn't have any intelligence, just a radio. And the, the uh, 
meters at the end of that that pocket of meters can relay through that repeater and out into a more populated area that has collectors. I'm not sure if that kind of addresses the question or not. Let's see. Keith says yes. See, you know your stuff, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. So, <laughs> Can you call my boss and tell him that? <laughs> I, I think he's actually on the call. So, <laughs> um, let's see here. I don't want to miss anybody's questions. So, I'm just going to go through one more time. Feel free, guys. I know we're getting right to the top of the hour here. If you've got to go, we understand. We always keep the recording running. We will definitely post this afterward for you guys. As well, if you think of a question afterward, you can always give us a shout. I'm looking through. I don't see anybody else. But Jim, you got a few minutes. You want to hang out with me a little bit and uh, see if anyone else hops on. Yeah, absolutely. Or maybe Keith has one more question, even though he said it was his last one. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, he says, thank you for that last question. <laughs> he tempted, but no. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, right. we're we're here, even if, if you can't think of anything right now. And as I said at the very beginning, if, if this presentation, you know, spawned a, a question that's roll, ro rolling around the back of your mind or or give you something else to think about, it might might not pop up for, for an hour or a day or a week. But, you know, feel free to uh, ask Andy and uh, Andy can get the questions to me and uh, we'll get back to you with anything that you might have not wanted to talk about. There's, as Andy said, there's no stupid questions. You know, if you haven't done an AMI rollout before, you're going to have questions uh, that you never thought you would ever ask. Uh, so, if anything like that pops into your head and you didn't want to speak up in front of the crew here, then just get a hold of Andy, let her know, or or my email address is right there on this slide. Feel free to contact me directly, and uh, um, we're here to help any way we can. We have been for over a hundred years, and uh, Tom says we're going to be around for another hundred years. I'm not probably going to see it, but anyway, <laughs> Tom's usually right. Yep. And yep, Keith, it just reiterates absolutely no stupid questions. Best to post publicly because it does prompt others to speak or get added ideas. But again, if you guys have something private to share, we're we're also okay to, you know, we will we will ask them out loud, but you know, I won't call on you guys or anything if you don't want that. But um well, I one last thing, Andy. Yeah. We talked about a conditions of service document, you know, several slides ago. And if your utility does not have such a thing, you can go online and, and just uh, type in a uh, utility conditions of service document and you'll find hundreds of excellent examples online of a, of a organized conditions of service document. It's a very important piece of uh, piece of, in, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Back up, you know, so that when you go to start running into these things, they will most likely be described in the conditions of service. And there's lots of them available online uh, for you to uh, download. They're not right protected or anything like that. They're a public document up here. Okay. So, one last thing I have for you, Jim, and you'll probably learn your lesson. Uh, you didn't have your camera rolling, but I have a flashback photo you had sent me a long time ago to prove that you were indeed an instructor for AMI rollout. So, if my screen will share <laughs> from, I think, 2011, you said. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see my screen yet or not. It's taking a while. Let's see. No, it's not going to cooperate. Ah, probably just as well. I have too many things in here. Open up, but uh, you had your own school or your own class you were teaching, and and you, you did a great job there. And job today, yeah, I don't think it's going to cooperate for me here. Let's see, or not. So, anyway, we did have proof, and uh. You were a great instructor and you were a great uh, presenter for today. So thank you for taking your time and doing this. And uh, there it is. Okay, you can see yourself then. <laughs> yeah, I'm that little guy on the left. <laughs> Here's Jim, everybody. So, <laughs> all right, everyone. I think we've got all your questions in, and we will see you next week for our uh, communication presentation with John Williams. And uh, we'll send out our recap, our rewind shortly to you guys. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll all see you next time.
Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thank